Hello everyone and welcome to Worship Online with Aurora United Church. It is Sunday, March 7th, our third Sunday in the season of Lent. Welcome. A reminder again this morning that the pale blue dot pins are still available for the next few weeks in keeping, of course, with our Lenten theme, Wilderness Wandering, Caring for God's Creation. And you can pick one up from Andy in the uh, Trinity parking lot um, on Saturday mornings between 9 and 10 a.m. while our Rise and Shine breakfast program is in progress. Our Lenten video study is ongoing Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Faith on the Move, daily reflections on hope and change. And if you'd like to join us, the Zoom information is on the AUC website. Also, seed packets will be distributed for our Gardens of Hope uh, beginning Saturday, March 20th, and again on March 27th. And again, that is during our Rise and Shine program. Many thanks today, of course, for those participating in worship, to the Stewart family, Chris, Dory, Graham, and Sophie, and of course, Sherlock, also Deborah Hilliard, and David Pilkey. Thanks all. And as in every week, thanks to Noah Komar, our videographer, and to Bob Kiriakides, our video editor. Welcome. Morning, everyone. Just a few things for me today. First of all, our virtual coffee time continues Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. All the information is on the website. We meet by Zoom. You can come in by video or by telephone. Um, our Fun Day Sunday program has been continuing now online for this whole year. And uh, if you would like to know what's happening with Fun Day Sunday, uh, check out our children's page under Connect on the website. So every Sunday we get together, we have a uh, time to meet one another. We watch a video related to the Bible story for the day. We play a game, we sing a song. And, and then we close in prayer. So it's a wonderful time for our families to be together every Sunday morning. Also, thank you to all of you who have been uh, keeping up and connecting with people in the congregation, either through telephone or Zoom, email, text, letters. Uh, it's very much appreciated by uh, those on the receiving end, and I'm sure by those who, who offer that service as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you for keeping in touch mm -hmm. with one another. So we light our Christ candle, welcoming God's presence to be with us in this time of worship. As we come into worship today, we acknowledge that we reside and worship on the traditional lands of the people of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. As people of the journey, we gather supporting so and uplifting one, one another. another as people of the journey we venture on unsure as to what lies around the next bend as people of the journey we go in faith confident, confident that, that god, god is, is with us. us as people of the journey we follow the light the light, the light that, that is, is in, in jesus. jesus as people of the journey we seek guidance the, the guidance, guidance of the, the holy, holy spirit. spirit come people of the journey the lenten path continues before us let, let us worship. worship our opening hymn today god who gives to life its goodness
Lori, Graham, Sophie, and Sherlock will lead us in our Lenten candle liturgy. Where is the time and place to listen for the still, small voice of God? These Lenten days invite us to go within. In Lent we journey to parts of ourselves known only to God. Let us pray. Draw us together in your love, O God. May we know your presence among us as we mark these Lenten days together. May we know your wisdom in seeking centered, mindful lives, aware of the world around us and relationships which enrich our lives. Amen. Today our video from Saddleback Kids is the New Testament story of Jesus clearing the temple. Enjoy. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. It is written in the scriptures, My temple will be called a house for prayer, but you are changing it into a hideout for robbers. The blind and crippled people came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of the law saw that Jesus was doing wonderful things and that the children were praising him in the temple, saying praise to the son of David. All these things made the priests and the teachers of the law very angry. They asked Jesus, Do you hear the things these children are saying? Jesus answered, Yes. Haven't you read in the scriptures? You have taught children and babies to sing praises? Then Jesus left and went out to the city of Bethany, where he spent the night. Deborah Hilliard has our first lesson today. The cross, representing ultimate defeat to the world, is the pathway of healing and wholeness. Only a suffering God can save. This is foolish in a world that glorifies power and individualism. And yes, in this foolishness, love wins and the world is saved. I'm reading from Paul's first to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks desired wisdom but we proclaim Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. For the word of God, for the people of God. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sunday, everyone. Margaret had asked if I would do a song, and she said it would be best if it would be public domain, so I was trying to think of a song that is old enough that it's public, and so I picked Amazing Grace, and the rendition is by Elvis Presley. Hope you enjoy. And today comes from the gospel according to John and I'm reading from the second chapter verses 13 through 22 where Jesus clears the temple the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple he found people selling cattle sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. 
His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Thanks be to God for these words of scripture. Amen. And so I invite you to simply let the silence of your sacred space impress itself on you in this time of reflection. Come to the quiet. Let these words lay themselves like a blessing upon your head, your shoulders, as if like hands they could pass on to you what you most need for this day. As if they could anoint you, not merely for the path ahead, but for this ordinary moment in worship that opens itself to you opens itself like another hand that unfurls itself, that reaches out to gather these words in the bowl of its palm. You may think this blessing lives within these words, but I tell you, it lives in the opening and in the reaching. It lives in the ache where this blessing begins. It lives in the hollow made by the place where the hands of this blessing meet. Amen. If you have driven past our church property on Young Street in the last several weeks or viewed the updated photos on our AUC website, you will have seen a dramatic change, a very welcome change, in the appearance of our church site. In order to level the land for preparations towards beginning our project, gray concrete block walls have been erected on three sides, holding the recently loaded soil in place. It will rest that way now for the next few months, compacting in on itself so that we can begin digging. Very exciting, very exciting. In the same way, we all tend to monitor building projects in our communities, watching their progress, wondering what the overall plan uh, will be. There are a lot of interested folks who've been watching our church site for a long time now. Social media being what it is, um, there's been a lot of chatter, a lot of wondering about that wall recently, and speculation as to what it is from just a really bad building design or trying to hide something. Well, we can laugh at some of that, I suppose. Logging on to our website would fill those blanks for anyone who is curious about what our plans actually are um, for that. Part of that speculation in the community, of course, really does have to do with the town's excitement about our church's renewal. Folks are excited about the prospect of seeing our church and retirement facility become a reality. While we understand that excitement deeply, we've been waiting on our hopes and dreams of returning to our church home coming up to seven years now. And in that time, we have been schooled in the art of patience and in the knowledge of what is involved in reimagining the life and mission of a church community our church community in a new building. It bears repeating though, those things we've learned in this time of wilderness wandering of another kind, that a church community can experience deep loss and prevail nevertheless, that it can go on and still be a church community, a congregation. 
We came to know what it means to pare down as we were left with so little and start over. We know what it is to lose a building, our, our church, our sacred space, such a big uh, part of our identity and for so long. We have supported one another and cheered each other along, reminding each other again that the church in truth is the people not only a building, and that has become our mantra over this time. This is what we carry with us still in this in-between time made more challenging now by having to leave yet another church building a year ago to worship online and to do church in ways that we could not have imagined seven years ago. Having our church building and development project actively moving forward now is like looking forward to Easter while still walking the Lenten path, like anticipating being vaccinated after a year of fear and worry, the embers of hope beginning to, to flicker with the promise of what is to come. When Jesus, passionate and angry Jesus, is yelling in the marketplace outside of the temple today. We come to the story with a measure of hard-won understanding of what it means to clear away the things that don't matter or that stand in the way to get to the source of those things that do. So Jesus certainly is not new to the temple. He knows its workings, participates in worship and study in the ongoing life of the temple. He also knows how it has changed over time. In the outer court of the Gentiles, worshipers purchase their sacrifices. It's how it's always been done. However, increasingly, through changing rules and requirements, the poor have ended up paying more than they can afford to participate in temple. And the outer court has become a barrier to worship rather than a gateway that opens to welcome them in. And today, Jesus has simply had enough. Today, he sees the incongruence of the situation where form and function have misstepped, and the place of meeting between God and God's people has been commercialized to the point where Jesus, seeing the injustices enacted there, cannot ignore it. To those who challenge his turning of the tables, Jesus makes a strange, confusing claim that he himself is the temple and that in three days I will raise it up. John's Gospel presents Jesus as one who takes into himself, into his own body and being, the purpose of the temple, being a place of mediation between God and human beings. In highlighting the role of the temple as a place of sacrifice, of celebration, of, of identity, and as a community, Jesus says effectively, I am this. He carries the temple in his own self. Well, we often speak of being the body of Christ in the world. And so as his body, as his living temple in the world, we are called to take on the forms that will most clearly welcome and mediate his presence that is in our bodies, in our lives, in our churches, our communities, and by our hospitality and by our spiritual practices. Biblical scholars have different theories about this story from John's Gospel. Some argue that what Jesus calls out in his cleansing or his clearing in the temple is not Judaism in itself or its various forms of worship, but the system of exploitation that charges exorbitant tithes and taxes that block equal access to the divine, that literally keeps the bodies of the poor outside the gates of the temple, forcing them into more and endless debt before they can approach and worship God. Other scholars argue that what displeases Jesus is a Sabbath-only faith that separates the temple 
out from the rest of the worship goers' lives, in effect, in effect compartmentalizing their faith so that temple is sacred and home is secular, and that one has so little to do with the other. In her book, An Altar in the World, Barbara Brown Taylor writes that it is not possible to lean into God's love for my body without also recognizing that God loves all bodies everywhere. In other words, once I value my own body as God's temple, as a site of God's love, delight, and grace, how can I stand by while other bodies suffer exploitation, poverty, discrimination, or abuse, wherever they are. So Jesus interrupts worship for the sake of justice. He moves from compassion to righteous anger to decisive action because he would not stand for the violation of the sanctuary. He would not tolerate blocked access to what he calls his father's house. He would not stomach any version of unfairness and cruelty towards the most vulnerable and beleaguered people in his community. During this Lenten season, then we might ask ourselves, where is my power to act or to deepen relationship or to love fiercely? Where has it been frozen up or atrophied or confined? Where has my faith become so abstract so disembodied that I no longer find it natural or easy to relate in compassionate, understanding, and loving ways to those around me, within my bubble. John Dominic Crossan, New Testament scholar, would say that the cost of living faith, of following Jesus in this way, is steep. He writes, that those who live by compassion are often canonized, that those who live by justice are often crucified. And yet still we are called to both, to compassion and to justice, embodied in our own selves and in the communities from which we serve. It is true that we have been focused on the future, and that has carried our fears and worries about the future. We relate to that now both as members of a congregation challenged by loss and as citizens in a world challenged by pandemic, just trying to balance out the now with what we pray will come. With vaccines rolling out with some measure of regularity now, we find ourselves looking to that time when the pandemic actually winds down and we can return to what we usually do. But we'll be different people by then, marked by all we've experienced in this time. While we continue to walk the Lenten pathway, it strikes us today that challenge brings change, that clearing away the things that just don't matter anymore brings opportunity for growth, and that hope is renewed in every day when we are able to share in compassion, justice and love in all the parts and places in our lives. Amen. Our hymn, Jesus Christ is Waiting.
Thank you for supporting the life and work of Aurora United Church. Your gifts are shared with many in our community, our country, and around the world, providing hope and newness of life. Thank you for being part of the body of Christ. Sharing time, talent, are all a part of our life together as a community of faith. When we each give our fair share, the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ expands and grows. Through the gifts we offer to ministries of this church and those at Mission and Service, we can demonstrate that all are welcomed and valued within this community. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we offer our gifts. May they be transformed into places of worship which include all, where everyone's resources are valued equally, and where money is not a barrier to participation in the realm of God. Amen. And so as we come to this time of the prayers of the people, I invite you to remember those who need to be held in God's love and care this day within the silence of the prayers. On this Sunday, we walk the Lenten pathway with Jesus. Let us pray. Creator, you are our God and we are your people. You are with us always. Truly, we are never alone. We proclaim this as our faith, even as we sometimes wonder are you among us or not? We thank you for your blessing that is expressed through the ministry of Operation Sharing in Woodstock, the Korean Women Workers Association, the Hungarian United Church in Toronto, Stuart Memorial United Church, Lake of Bays, St. Andrew's United Church, Toronto, and St. Paul's United Church, Brampton. Help us to remember those in need who may feel disconnected from you and your creation. We pray also for those who live with a chronic illness, who live with cancer and who are grieving the loss of a loved one. May they know your healing comfort. We pray for those who struggle to stay alive due to war, famine, or oppression. May your presence be known in them. We need to believe that the joys we have experienced and the blessings that we have shared will help to sustain us during times when we feel alone and downtrodden. We need to believe that healing is possible as we pray for Ken, Joyce, Lori, Carol, Faith, Penny, Peter, James, Avery, Ord. COVID-19 has stripped away so much that we thought we needed, O oh God. It has brought us back to the realization that faith, community, connections between one another, the basics of touch and hugging and face-to-face -face communication, those are our roots and our strength. Bring us back together across borders, languages, and economic divides. As more vaccines are approved and enter production and distribution, Hasten the day, O oh God, when we can share birthdays and weddings. Comfort the ill. Grieve together with the dying. Take comfort in common worship and rejoice in common meals. As the pandemic eases, let us not forget our roots. Hold us fast above all to love. Guide us wisely as leaders and as followers. Grant us the courage to change when change is needed to stand up against oppression when endangered, to maintain that which is good, no matter the pressures against us. Inspire us to take our turn, to share in the responsibilities of weaving our communities together. And so we pray for El Salvador as they come to terms with the new government after this past Monday's legislative elections. The many countries that consistently block internet access during protests or elections thereby also blocking millions of people from working, studying, accessing health care, getting vital information about the pandemic or buying essential goods. Help us to know when to wait, when to rise, whom to follow, and where you are calling us to go. Help us to be the people you are calling us to be. We pray for Afghanistan as talks resume this week between the Taliban and the government. We pray for migrant workers from Myanmar and Cambodia who are now stranded, unemployed and penniless, unable to find jobs in either their native lands or in Thailand. 
God, you have given us a vision of the human family, your beloved family all gladly living side by side. Yet the logistics of finding enough shelter, jobs, and resources are daunting. Give us a vision of those details too. Make it possible for every single human being to have a place to call home. All of these prayers we offer up because you want to hear them. All of these words we offer up because you invite us to share the deepest joys and concerns of our hearts. All of ourselves we offer up because you, O God, have told us that we are bound together by your strong love. Your love, O God, and our hope and our faith. Your love is proven in Jesus, in whose name we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, He Leadeth Me.
May the path that Christ walks to bring justice upon the earth, to bring light to those who sit in shadows, to bring out those who live in servitude, and to bring new things to all creation. May this path run through our lives. May, May we, we be, be the, the road, road that Christ I takes. Speaks. And now let us go gladly into the world as we are able to be filled with the love of God. Dance to the song of the Spirit and reflect the Christ in each new day. Amen.